Welcome back, Eco Nerdlings. In this podcast, we're going to be discussing alternative fuels. By definition, alternative fuel is any fuel that meets certain emission standards, or they give off a certain amount of pollution or less. There are several laws that are involved with clean emissions. We have the Clean Air Act, Amendments of 1990, the Energy Policy Act in Texas of 1992. Some of these laws have led to more research and development of these alternative fuels. So some of the examples of alternative fuels include biodiesel, diesel, biogas, hydrogen cells. So for biodiesel, it's made out of vegetable oils and alcohols. However, biodiesel is very expensive to make. Diesel is cleaner than normal gasoline and it's being more refined. Biogas is a byproduct of decaying vegetation, but we do need more technology. Hydrogen is very expensive, and we need more technology for that as well. Ethanol and methanol are alcohols, and they're not as efficient as far as miles per gallon, and we don't have all of the technology we need to make them as efficient as we, co- as we possibly could. Also, if our grain supplies are used to make fuel, are we going to have enough grain to feed the world? Natural gas is also an alternative fuel. It's expensive, and we do need more technology. We also have reformulated gasoline, which is regular gas that's been further refined to remove some of the more toxic pollutants. And then we have propane, which is most usable form of alternative fuel, but it's not as efficient as well as miles per gallon go. We have syngas, which is a synthetic gasoline. It's man-made and it's made out of hydrogen and carbon monoxide. And we do need more technology in order to use this as well. So as far as hydrogen goes, there's some energy experts that view hydrogen gas as the best fuel to replace oil during the last half of the century. However, there are several hurdles that we need to overcome before hydrogen gas can be readily available. First of all, hydrogen is chemically locked up in water as well as organic compounds, and we have to have a way of extracting that efficiently. It takes energy and money to produce it, and the net energy is low. The fuel cells that we use to store the hydrogen energy are also very expensive. And hydrogen may be produced by using fossil fuels. So some of the other energy laws include the Public Utility Holding Company Act of 1935. This regulated the interstate flow of energy, and it was actually the first law of its kind. This was a law that designated to protect consumers from corporate abuse of electricity markets. Basically, they didn't want to have one electrical company having a complete monopoly over all of the electrical consumers. So the electric companies couldn't price gouge. And this actually started happening during the Great Depression. So we also have the Corporate Average Fuel Economy Act of 1975. This focused attention on the efficiency of cars. Mile per gallon stickers were actually required. So any car lot or car dealership you go to typically has a little sticker that denotes the miles per gallon of gas that a car will get. We also have the Public Utility Regulatory Policies Act of 1978. This is when higher utility rates were given for increased electricity usage. So this was basically trying to motivate people not to use as much electricity. So what about converting plants and plant wastes to liquid biofuels? How does that occur? Well, motor vehicles can run on ethanol, biodiesel, and methanol, which is produced from plants, as well as plant wastes. The major advantages of biofuels include that crops used for production can be grown pretty much anywhere in the world. There isn't really any net increase in carbon dioxide emissions, and it is also widely available, and it's easy to store and transport. So crops such as sugarcane, corn, switchgrass, and agricultural forestry, as well as municipal wastes, can be converted into ethanol. Switchgrass can actually remove carbon dioxide from the troposphere and store it in the soil. So in about 10 to 23% of pure ethanol makes gasohol, which can be run in conventional motors. We also have 85% ethanol, called E85, and it has to be burned in a flex fuel car. We have processing all corn grown in the United States into ethanol could actually cover only about 55 days of current driving. 
and biodiesel is made by combining alcohol with vegetable oil made from a variety of different plants. So biodiesel and methanol. So growing crops for biodiesel could potentially promote deforestation. And methanol is made mostly from natural gas, but it can also be produced at higher costs from carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, which could help slow global warming. It can also be converted into other hydrocarbons to produce chemicals that are now made from petroleum and natural gas. So what are some ways to improve energy efficiency? Well, the average fuel economy of new vehicles sold in the United States between 1975 to 2006 actually improved energy efficiency. Basically, we were getting more miles per gallon as the centuries, or not the centuries, the decades went by. However, when we got to about 2006, we kind of got to a dead stop and leveled off. So if you look at this graph, starting in about 1975, most vehicles were getting between 10 and 15 miles per gallon of gas. And as we went along in our years and got closer to 2000, the gas efficiency went up, and we got about an average of 25 miles per gallon. Unfortunately, this hasn't really increased after 2006 too much. You do start seeing uh, more in the market, you know, a little bit more hype about hybrid cars and electric vehicles and things like that. But the government or the corporate average fuel economy has not really increased after 1985. So looking at the way that a hybrid car works, it has general features of a car that are powered by hybrid electric gasoline engine. So, and they're called gas sipping cars. They do account for about less than 1% of all new car sales in the United States. So that means there's not too many people driving hybrid cars out there, and that's unfortunate. So they have their fuel tank, they have a regulator, a transmission, a battery, the electric motor, and the combustion engine. And so they're not always using electrical energy, they are using gasoline as well. And there's a way that it charges whenever we hit the brakes uh, that actually charges the battery and things like that. But these type of cars get huge, huge uh, numbers of miles per gallons of gas more than the average vehicle will. So hybrid vehicle sustainable wind power and oil imports. Well, hybrid gasoline electric engines with an extra plug-in battery could be powered mostly by electricity produced by wind and get twice the mileage of current hybrid cars. Currently, plug-in batteries would be generated by coal and nuclear power plants. And according to the United States Department of Energy, a network of wind farms in just four states could actually meet all the United States electricity means. So this is something that your generation has to look at in the future of how are we going to get around our energy crisis. So we also have fuel cell vehicles. These are fuel efficient vehicles powered by a fuel cell that runs on hydrogen gas and they are being developed. It combines hydrogen gas and oxygen gas fuel to produce electricity and water vapor. It emits absolutely no air pollution or carbon dioxide if the hydrogen is produced from renewable energy sources. Obviously, another way we can conserve energy is not using public transportation or cars at all and using a bike. So another act that went into play was the National Appliance and Energy Act of 1987. This energy efficiency sticker was applied to all appliances and that kind of gave the user an idea of how much it was going to cost to run that appliance. We also have the Hydrogen Future Act of 1996 and it developed hydrogen as an energy source. The problem with a lot of these acts are that we actually had to provide money needed for research and renewable resources if we're going to use these. And there's not a lot of money that's given to research and development currently. Well, I hope you learned a little bit about alternative fuels. If you'd like to rewatch this video lecture or any others for AP Environmental Science, please visit my website at www.nerdlingscience.com. Well, this is the Queen Nerdling signing off for now. Stay nerdy till next time.